based in Kansas City that is behind the new Superior Solar Project that I'm proud to say was just granted a special use permit by the Sands Township Planning Commission on December 15th, 2020. And basically the Superior Solar Project, Courtney's gonna tell you a lot more, but it's 150 megawatt uh, solar project, which, you know, fingers crossed, looks like it's gonna come up in Sands Township, roughly seven miles from um, Northern Michigan University on um, 1500 acres of Cleveland Cliffs uh, land. Did I get that all correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so without further ado, um, Courtney, thank you so much for joining us. Take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, really happy to, to be here and, and talking with all of you. I think this is one of my uh, favorite parts of the job is getting to work with, uh, with uh, locals. And this, is, uh, this project is uh, especially exciting for me because I actually grew up um, in Scandia and went to uh, Gwynn School System uh, and then went on to uh, to Northern Michigan University. So um, I actually used to, you know, where this project is, I used to drive trucks with my friends. Uh, so um, definitely have a, a lot of experience in the, uh, the local area. And so it's been kind of my dream to work on a project uh, near my hometown. Um, and it's just been fantastic. So um, as I mentioned, you know, I was at uh, Northern and, you know, for all the students that were on, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I kind of was switching majors um, as I was uh, going. And uh, while I was there, I joined uh, Army National Guard out of Ishpeming. And we ended up getting deployed to Iraq for about a year in, in 2005. Um, and while I was there, I had this soldier who was just constantly chirping in my ear. He was also an enemy of uh, that as well uh, about he was going to put up some wind turbines uh, at his house and sell the power back into the grid. And I, I thought he was crazy. Um, but the more I thought about it and the more I looked into it, I was like, wow, that is a really cool concept to use wind to create viable energy. And the more I thought about it, the, the more it just got stuck in my head and, and the more interested I, I was. So, um, got home from Iraq and went back to, to Northern and said, hey, I wanna get into uh, wind energy. Um, and uh, Northern was like, well, we don't really have any programs for that, but here's some ideas, right? And so I worked with the professors and the advisors there to come up with some ideas. Um, and uh, you know, while I was there, I also reached out to Rich Vanderveen, who's on the, uh, the call. Uh, Rich put up the, uh, the wind turbines that are uh, near the Mackinac Bridge. And of course, you can't go across the Mackinac Bridge without noticing those wind turbines. So I gave Rich a call and said, hey, I'm a Northern student and I'm really interested in this. What can you tell me about it? And Rich really helped me um, in uh, you know, working into the industry uh, and making some connections. Um, in addition to that, Northern uh, also, I did some work at Northern as a student um, that was geared towards wind energy. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to present one of uh, a poster at the uh, uh, annual industry conference uh, that was in LA. And uh, while I was there, I, you know, I sent around some resumes and, and with Rich's help was able to, to land a job. Um, but Northern sent me to that conference and it was Northern work that I was um, you know, putting together. So um, you know, Northern really helped propel me kind of out into the, into the industry. Certainly had to do a lot of work myself, but um, you know it was uh, you know very happy to uh, to have come from Northern and what Northern was able to do to me to help me get into the industry that I'm that I'm interested in. Um, so I've been in the industry for about 12 years. I started out as a consultant uh, for a company called AWS True Power. What they specialize in is uh, evaluating the evaluating and predicting the resource assessment and energy output for wind and solar projects. So that included putting up um, uh, meteorological equipment to record data at project sites uh, so that we could get a highly accurate uh, estimate of what the energy output would be for these projects, which is incredibly important for uh, selling the power and doing the financing for, uh, for these projects. So I was there for about seven years and I got to work on hundreds of different uh, uh, projects in that capacity. 
Uh, but ultimately what I wanted to do was build my own projects. And so I had an opportunity to uh, work for a company called Invenergy outside of Chicago. Uh, Invenergy is the largest independent power producer in uh, North America. Uh, while I was there, I was really lucky to get assigned to the Texas region and I was able to successfully develop three wind farms uh, for the most part by myself in, in Texas. So that equated to about 720 megawatts of wind energy, um, which is somewhere around uh, 300 plus wind turbines. Um, so that was an amazing experience. Uh, while I was there, I also got to um, site, work on a, a program to site uh, new solar projects also in Texas and about uh, a gigawatt of those projects have been um, either uh, in, uh, uh, currently in construction or are completed. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of bring this knowledge and experience that I've gained in the industry um, to the Upper Peninsula to make a really great uh, solar project. Um, so I'm going to, uh, sure, I've got a presentation ready here for you. There we go. Ryan, can you see that okay? Good? Okay. Yep, come through. Great. Okay. Um, so I have a presentation here for you about the project and um, uh, some other information as well that we put together for you. Uh, uh, real quickly about Savion, um, our company is headquartered out of uh, Kansas City. Uh, it was founded actually in 2019 when a former company called Tradewind Energy, which was a very successful wind and solar uh, development company, uh, was purchased by its equity backer and the project was split uh, from its, its wind side to its solar side and the original founders of the company uh, went with the solar side and created Savion. So um, while the company name is new, um, these people have been working together for oh, over 10 years, I, I believe, and some of these projects um, they've been working on for uh, roughly that time as, as well, mostly not that old, but um, so the uh, the uh, company, the people working on it and the projects uh, have all been working together for, for several years now. Um, we've got about a, a, over 100 employees now um, working in various fields of you know, renewable energy um, uh, you know, needs and requirements. Uh, as far as our uh, success to date, uh, we've put about 26 projects into operation or currently under construction or contracted. Contracted means we sold the power from those projects and they'll be moving forward. Um, so we've got 26 successful projects under our belt. Um, and we've got over 100 projects that are in development all across the United States. Those consist of both uh, solar projects like the Superior Project and also uh, battery storage projects as well. Uh, battery storage works uh, kind of like a, a, a reusable battery, but on a larger scale. Um, the battery is charged either by the grid or by um, a, 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 a power project. Uh, and then uh, it, that power is discharged at a time when, when the grid wants it. So um, it, it's, you know, a big reusable battery essentially. A little bit about how solar works. So uh, what happens here is uh, for the, the solar panels convert sunlight into energy um, and then there's an inverter that converts DC electricity into AC electricity. So to simplify that essentially um, the sun's energy uh, is coming down to the earth um, that is picked up by the solar panels. The solar panels create a current um, and then that current is sent uh, throughout the project and collected at a, a central location, or it's routed to a central location, um, to a substation. And then that substation will uh, convert the power up to the voltage of the grid. And then that power goes out onto the grid. And after, uh, you know, from the grid, it goes to wherever the power is needed. That could be homes, businesses, whatever is using power. So the Superior Solar Project, uh, by the numbers here. So it is a 150 megawatt project uh, that re represents a 100 to $150 million capital investment in Marquette County. Uh, at that level, it's estimated to produce 15 to 20 million in new tax revenue over 30 years, which is a huge deal for uh, Marquette County and also uh, Stans Township. Uh, the project is expected to create 200 temporary construction jobs and uh, create a couple of permanent full-time jobs as well. 
The project is expected to last 30 years. Uh, and uh, our estimates are showing that it will power um, 35,000 to 40,000 average Michigan homes every year. The project uh, will likely be somewhere around 1,500 acres or less. Uh, that sounds like a really big area, um, but it actually makes up less than 0.2% of the land in, in Marquette County. Um, and if everything goes well, we'd be looking at starting construction two to three years, um, in two to three years. The picture on this slide is, uh, uh, it's called, it's Hiller Road. Um, this is a road that comes off of uh, the road, the highway out to Gwynn, and then goes into the, uh, the project area. This portion of the road is called Tunnel Road, um, which is a really scenic area. And you know, the, uh, all of the recreation that happens out here, they, they love this, this, uh, this road. Um, and so what we did is we actually designed around this road um, because of its uh, natural beauty. So I'd love to show that picture because it's so pretty. And, and also, um, you know, when we find things like this, we work to uh, not uh, impact uh, uh, resources like this. This is a map of the general project area. So up here, you've got uh, crossroads. So this is crossroads where 553 and, and 480 meet. Um, it's about a six mile drive south of uh, uh, Marquette past the, uh, the ski hill. Um, the orange boundary here is the uh, boundary of land that's been leased from the landowner. Um, it's primarily one landowner who's uh, in, the, uh, in the project area. Um, if you are familiar with the area, this is uh, sort of a um, informal shooting range uh, that's up here next to the Goose Lake Access. Uh, this is the Goose Lake Access Road, actually, and up here is, uh, is Goose Lake itself. There's also kind of a, a gravel pit or sort of like, uh, you know, earth material staging area that, that's up here, too, if you're familiar with, uh, with the area. This blue line is a 345 uh, kV transmission line. So this transmission line is uh, somewhat the backbone of the grid for the Upper Peninsula. It comes from uh, Wisconsin and goes straight up to uh, Marquette and the majority of the uh, grid infrastructure in the UP is coming off of uh, this, this 345 TV line. Uh, and that's generally our project area. Oh, something else to note, this is trail eight or the snowmobile trail. Uh, this is a seasonal road um, and in the uh, wintertime, it becomes a DNR snowmobile trail. And this trail coming off here, this is the trail uh, that goes up to the crossroads businesses. So this was another very important road because it connected the snowmobilers uh, to these businesses up here at crossroads. And so we worked with these crossroads businesses uh, to uh, keep this trail open and keep that, that business flowing. So development progress to date. This is what we've done on the project so far. From a land perspective, uh, we've got an option for solar lease completed uh, for over 2,000 acres and preliminary title has been reviewed, uh, which looks fine. Our interconnection application has been submitted to MISO in June. So MISO is the mid intercontinental system operator. They're essentially the folks who operate and manage the grid. Um, and in order to be able to inject your power onto the grid, you have to work with the transit transmission owner and also MISO to schedule and study your project for how it's gonna impact the grid. And once everything looks good, then you're given, you're given an interconnection uh, application and uh, you're allowed to, to essentially go forward and, and build your project. This study process takes about two to three years. Uh, and so we've started it in, uh, in June last year. Permitting, uh, so some good news here. Sands Township provided a conditional use permit uh, approved in December, 2020. A whole lot of work uh, went into that, who uh, a lot of you were, were involved in. Thank you very much for, for those efforts. Uh, but this is a huge milestone for the project in securing its, its permits. Uh, this gives the company uh, comfort to continue investing uh, capital into the, uh, the opportunity. From an environmental perspective, we've, uh, we've had North Jackson, who's a, a local engineering firm, uh, complete an aquifer report for us. Uh, Sands Township uh, sits above an aquifer that's very important to the uh, locals' water supply. And so that was a critical resource that we wanted to uh, evaluate and ensure that we didn't have any impact um, to that resource. Uh, we've also uh, done a critical issues analysis, threatened and endangered species surveys, wetland surveys, a phase one ESA. That phase one ESA is sort of, uh, you're looking for 
uh, environmental contaminants. You know, common things are um, oil spills or leaking barrels or trash dump sites, things of that nature. Um, the project wants to make sure that when it starts building this project, it's not going to run into an abandoned gas tank or something like that and have a, a huge environmental issue. Uh, we performed a, a cultural review and uh, we've uh, begun coordination with the uh, Michigan DMR. Uh, the project has also collected 14 months of specialized solar energy data uh, near the site. Um, so that picture that you're seeing right there is our uh, solar monitoring station. This was installed over at uh, KI Sawyer, um, which is where uh, we have another project that's, that's uh, in development. Uh, that system, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but the instruments on that system include uh, wind speed, wind direction, air pressure, uh, irradiance, um, and those solar panels that you're seeing. What happens with those solar panels is we want to measure uh, soiling that occurs out in this area. And so uh, once a week, a technician will go out there and clean one of those solar panels and then leave the other one dirty. dirty. Uh, and then we can uh, we record data from the two solar panels to compare the output of the two panels, one being clean and one being dirty. Um, and that informs us how to estimate how soiling is going to occur uh, at this area. Um, engineering, we've done uh, conceptual project designs, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment, and power sales are ongoing. Power sales are incredibly important. Uh, in order for the project to get financing, it has to sell the power from the project before it's actually built. It's kind of like getting a mortgage for your house. Uh, your bank wants to know that you can make your mortgage payments before it will give you that mortgage. Same thing applies with a, a solar project. Um, you want to, uh, you know, the financiers that will become partners of the project want to make sure that the project is going to uh, operate and they're going to get their return on investment um, before the project is, is built. Progress to date on public outreach. So this was really important up here in the Upper Peninsula. There have been a lot of renewable energy projects, both wind and solar, that have been attempted um, and shut down due to uh, inability to get permitting. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the UP, I, I come from the UP, it's a naturally beautiful area and, um, you know, generally the local population is not interested in seeing a large wind turbine uh, or taking up a, a lot of land for solar, um, especially, um, you know, any, any kind of forest land. Um, so, uh, we knew that we were going to have a big public outreach um, opportunity for ourselves to, in order to, um, you know, get people comfortable with the project. Uh, solicit information for how we can make the project work better for the community um, and uh, also, you know, ultimately get those permits that we need. So in order to do that, we developed a, a project website and also a project Facebook page to provide information about the project online. Uh, we had, we held a public open house in October that was at the Sands Township Pavilion outside and actually that picture there is um, the, uh, that, that, that public meeting. Um, we did a, a virtual community meeting as well that was held in October. Uh, we became members of the Lake Superior Community Partnership, uh, and we held dozens of stakeholder meetings uh, with residents, local businesses, including the businesses at Crossroads, um, the local recreational clubs, including the Sandstormers Dirt Bike Club, um, who have some some areas out here that they really uh, they really like using. Uh, also, the Hiawatha Land Snowmobile Club as well. Uh, the Snowmobile Club is, uh, they've got facilities right there at Crossroads, and so they were a very important group for us to, to work with, especially since there's a DNR trail, Trail 8 running right through there. Uh, Sands Township, Market County, NMU, uh, the Gwing School District, UP Economic Development Group, and, and many, many others. We held uh, just dozens of community meetings or local stakeholder meetings uh, to share information about the project and uh, then solicit support for how we can make the project work with the community. Uh, through those efforts, we received broad community support. Um, we had a grassroots uh, support group uh, that formed uh, consisting of residents, students, teachers, and, and businesses. Uh, this was really wonderful because we really didn't do a lot of uh, work uh, at this. This kind of formed organically. Um, and uh, you know, that was just uh, fantastic to see that kind of proactive support um, coming from the, uh, the community. Um, that group put together a local 
uh, petition supporting the project, which was really, really great. Uh, we had over 1,600 positive engagements on the project Facebook page. Um, and we received community support from you know, the folks on that list there. I'm not going to go through everybody, but um, you know, elected officials, uh, you know, um, community boards, uh, community organizations, local businesses. Uh, we really just uh, uh, were able to put together a lot of support um, through the project work and also that, that uh, coalition that was formed. So this is a map of the product design uh, that we put together. So that outer boundary uh, kind of in, in purple, this is the project area that we're working up in. Um, an initial design that we put together, uh, you can see these are the panels, this kind of gray are panels and the, the red are, are roads uh, that are within the project area. Um, a key thing to note here is this yellow uh, line is fencing. So instead of fencing the entire uh, area, we only fenced the, uh, the actual uh, facilities that were in the project area. And what that did was limited our impact on local use and uh, uh, the environment as well uh, by leaving you know, these, these uh, corridors open. Um, as you can see here, this is Trail 8 and the seasonal road that runs through the project. Uh, our plan is to leave that mostly untouched. Um, that was based on the, the feedback from the community as well as the DNR. This is that trail that runs out to crossroads that we talked about before. This trail is very important because it facilitates business getting out to those crossroads uh, businesses. Uh, we also uh, work with the DNR and, and also some of those crossroads businesses uh, to straighten out that trail or what we're proposing is to straighten out that trail. Uh, a straight out trail means that snowmobile traffic can see each other uh, coming and going. Um, from opposite directions, with, with, uh, which helps with safety. Uh, so we we're, we were happy with that. Um, one adjustment that we made here, this is that Hiller Road that we talked about. And uh, this portion in here is that tunnel portion, uh, which we worked to, uh, to leave intact. Um, and we routed the portion of Hiller Road that kind of goes into the plains around the project in order to make a nice clean uh, rectangle. Uh, this area up here is the Sand Stormers Dirt Bike Staging Area. So if you're familiar with the area, there's a, a sign next to the road that says you know, campfires. Um, and if you're out here, there's usually people that are either camping out here or um, they're, they're staging their equipment and vehicles to go dirt biking. Um, their feedback was they really liked their staging area. And so we uh, designed away from that staging area. Uh, additionally, the, the, res the closest residents to the project are, are up here, um, and their feedback, not surprisingly, was please keep it as far away from us as, as you can. We like living out in the woods, and so um, we started you know, building our project kind of from the south up so that we could create as much distance from these residences up here. Uh, the closest resident is about a half a mile away, and this is a fantastic residential impact story for a solar project. Typically, it's hard to find this much acreage without it being next to a home. Um, and so, uh, you know, most of the projects that I work with will have, you know, two or three homes that are non participating residents uh, that are, are, you know, right next to the project. This project has an uh, outstanding uh, residential impact from the standpoint of the nearest house is half a mile away through the woods. Um, so, uh, very little residential impact. Um, there was also some cultural areas uh, that, that pop, popped up over here from our, our cultural work that we did. So we worked to avoid those. Also the wetlands that were find, found on site, the, uh, one of the only jurisdictional wetlands was over here. And so we avoided that. This uh, feature that you're seeing right here is the new gas pipeline that was put in. If you've been out at the site, this is a, a pretty large uh, space of, of open area of trees where they installed that pipeline. Um, what we did is we worked to keep our entire project to the east of that pipeline uh, in order to stay away from some of the resources that are over here, including recreational trails, Bruce Lake, um, and some of the cultural uh, resources as well. Future development. So what we'll be doing in the future, uh, performing an Ulta survey. Um, that is a, a very uh, detailed geographic survey that also overlaps all of the easements uh, that are in the area that, that aren't easy to see. Also any uh, features that are above the ground, below the ground going to that survey. 
Uh, we'll also do uh, a title endorsement as well to ensure that the, uh, the chain of title on the, pro the property, who owns the property, uh, is consistent and there's no risk associated with, with uh, um, the ownership of the property. Uh, we'll continue doing electrical studies and uh, work on that interconnection agreement. On the permitting side of things, there will be a site building permit that we'll have to work with on, on Sands Township once the project ready to go into construction. We'll also have permitting requirements for Market County and state and federal permitting as well. From an environmental standpoint, we'll be working on uh, cultural surveys, these are the on-site cultural surveys to ensure that we don't impact any cultural resources. There'll be additional phase one ESAs. Those are those uh, studies to look for any kind of uh, environmental uh, hazards or contam contaminants out at the site. Uh, and we'll continue coordination, coordination with Michigan DNR, the State Historic Preservation Office, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. From an engineering standpoint, we'll be doing uh, detailed geotechnical assessments. Uh, what those include is uh, we essentially bore a hole into the ground and we take samples of what the uh, soil conditions are um, up to 50 feet below the ground. We want to ensure that whatever is below the ground will support the project and, and de-risk um, the, uh, the engineering design. Uh, and we'll continue doing uh, power purchase agreements uh, as, as well. Uh, the picture here is, is pretty interesting. This is an example of a bifacial panel. Um, what's uh, interesting about these bifacial panels is uh, they collect solar energy from both sides of the panel. So your, your typical solar panel that you might see in somebody's house uh, will only uh, collect uh, the sun from one side. Um, some brilliant engineer somewhere said, well, why block uh, the backside? Why not just keep it open and we'll collect um, the solar energy that's bouncing off of the surface of the earth going back up on the backside. And so these are essentially two-sided solar panels. They're incredibly efficient. Um, this is also important in uh, the UP climate, which I'll, I'll talk more about later, uh, to help uh, melt snow off of the, uh, off the panels. Milestone schedule for the project. So uh, we've got our interconnection application su submitted, our solar lease is completed, our permit has been approved. Uh, we are currently working on those power purchase agreements. Um, and if all goes according to plan, we could start construction uh, in late 22 or 23 with uh, commercial operations starting either in late 23 or uh, late 24. A couple construction uh, pictures to kind of show you what construction looks like. So the solar panels are held, held up by essentially these I-beams. These I-beams are sunk uh, directly into the ground. And then these, uh, these uh, racks are installed on top of those, those I-beams. Uh, important thing that I want to show you here is that um, the vegetation on the ground, the intent here is to not disturb vegetation already on the ground as much as possible. Some grading will need to happen in order to uh, flatten out the earth where uh, the, uh, you know, the, the elevation of the earth doesn't make it feasible for the project. And so you can see here where some grading uh, occurred and also you know, the road that was put in as well. In this picture over here, you can see uh, that vegetation is, is then reseeded. And uh, we, we want that vegetation to grow underneath the, uh, the project. That's very important uh, to manage soil erosion um, as well as uh, uh, other things. Um, so yeah, these are the piles uh, that are sunk into the ground and then these racks are installed on top. Uh, once those racks are installed, then a, a racking system, uh, these arms are installed onto those racks and the solar, panel, solar panels are then affixed to those racks. Now, this probably won't be the exact design of the Superior Solar Project, um, but the concept is, is generally the same. Uh, again, a couple things to note are the vegetation that are underneath the panels um, and the space that are in between the, the panels as well. Um, that space is open for snow to fall, rain to fall, uh, and the like, um, uh, and it also breaks up the, uh, the, uh, the project for a wild life uh, as well, which is important. So this is an example of a finished project. Um, you know, the Superior Solar will be a little bit different, but this is the, the, uh, similar to what it will eventually look like. Um, and again, take note of the space in between panels uh, and also the vegetation that is underneath those panels. 
Uh, the other thing that I'd like to point out is uh, see how the, the project is flowing with the land. So it's, uh, it's expensive to grade land. And so where possible, uh, we want to keep the land as it was and then build on, on top of that. Uh, one, to save cost, and two, minimize our disruption to the land and the vegetation that's underneath it. Uh, the other thing that's important to note here is the spacing in between panels. Um, one of the concerns that comes up sometimes is that birds may recognize this feature as being water. Um, and the uh, spacing that happens in between panels helps to break up the project so the birds recognize it as not being uh, uh, water. So why this location? So there's some common questions that we get quite a bit. Um, why this spot? Uh, we get a lot of people ask us, well, why not put it on K.I. Sawyer? Why not put it on top of the mine? Um, you know, different, different ideas uh, like that. Um, the reason why this location is, is really an outstanding location for a solar project, uh, there's a few reasons. One is you have a single private landowner um, that helps facilitate development and helps uh, de-risk the project for financiers. There is a 345 kV transmission line located within the project um, that's highly advantageous because that is a, a big transmission line. Like I said, it's the backbone of the Upper Peninsula. So if you can tap into the backbone, that's really one of the best places to get into the grid to help facilitate uh, movement of power uh, throughout the project. Um, there also is a, a 138 uh, kV transmission line that's, on the pro that's near the project as well. And we're evaluating, um, looking at that uh, line also. Uh, the project is located to make away from major roads uh, to help preserve the natural beauty of the, uh, the Upper Peninsula. Uh, it's also located in their major power users, uh, that being uh, you know, Marquette, the city of Marquette, and also uh, the Cliffs Mine, which is nearby. Uh, and the site also has promising environmental and, and engineering conditions. Uh, how will the project impact wildlife? Um, so the project really expected to, to have minimal impact um, to local wildlife. Uh, after construction is complete, the wildlife will return to normal patterns post-construction. Uh, keep in mind that project fencing includes open corridors. Um, so deer and uh, other animals will be able to move through the project. Uh, and we're continuing to coordinate with the Michigan DNR and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, that consultation process involves us showing them our project. They give us recommendations for uh, how to build, design the project or mitigation um, opportunities. And uh, then the, the project um, will work with the DNR and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to put those in, in place. Also recreation, this is another big question that we get out here. Uh, there's a lot of trails that are out here. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're coordinated with the local clubs, crossroads businesses, Michigan DNR, uh, who manages those trail systems uh, to uh, evaluate the best way to design uh, the project so that it can you know, exist in harmony with those recreational uses. And we can have as little an impact on those rec recreational uses as possible. Um, also, an important note, this is privately owned land, um, and it represents 0.2% of land in Market County. Um, there is a Commercial Forest Act land on this property, and uh, in Market County, this area represents 0.5% of that CFA land, and about 0.8% of the trails in Market County. So, um, you know, some of the feedback that we get is, wow, this seems like a really big area, you're taking away a lot of recreation land. Um, and you know, the answer to that is uh, we're actually helping preserve and, and in some cases improve the recreation land that's out here. Um, and really, when you look at the numbers, this makes up a very small um, amount of recreational opportunities in Market County, uh, let alone the entire UP. Other common questions that we get, this is probably the biggest one. Can solar really work up there in the UP? It's cloudy, it's snowy, um, and it's cold. Believe me, I get it. I grew up out here and spent, um, it, it, I, I like to say 18 years shoveling off my parents' roof uh, through snow, but my dad heard one of these presentations and he, and he said, you didn't spend 18 years doing that. So there's a disagreement there, but um, I, I get it. I know about uh, how cold and snowy and cloudy it can be up there. And the good news is uh, solar has seen huge improvements um, in, the, in the last 10 years. Uh, we've also collected 14 months of specialized data out here, so we have actual on-site data of what the, the uh, solar resource looks like, uh, including in the wintertime. 
Um, one thing that's really beneficial, solar panels do the best uh, in colder temperatures versus hot. They, they like cool, uh, sunny places, and uh, the UP definitely uh, has that at times. Um, and also snow. What about the, the large amounts of snow um, that, that happen out here? And it's true, this is definitely a very, uh, an area that receives a lot of snow. There's a few different uh, mitigation opportunities that a solar project uh, can take advantage of when it comes to solar and uh, snow. And some of these are natural to, uh, to a snow project, uh, or excuse me, a solar project. And that's, um, you know, the, the, the snow will melt off the solar panels. Uh, the solar panels, when they're operating, will produce um, a small amount of heat. And that's enough heat to help facilitate melting of, of the snow. Um, going back to those bifacial solar panels. Uh, so, you know, if there is snow that's stuck to the, to the, uh, the solar panels, the backside of those panels is still open and will uh, receive um, uh, uh, radiation essentially, which helps warm up that solar panel and helps um, support the, uh, the snow sliding off that, that panel. In addition to that, if any part of the panel is exposed, it will start creating electricity and it will start generating small amounts of heat. And so um, if even just a, a corner of it uh, becomes exposed, it will help facilitate, you know, warming up that panel and shedding that snow. Also, the angle of the tilt um, is, uh, will help facilitate uh, snow coming off of that, that uh, solar panel. Um, also, wind and time, too. So wind will blow snow off the panels. And uh, it's okay too if the panels are covered for a couple of days in the uh, in the winter time after a snow event. Um, you know these are the, the lower producing months, and so if those panels are covered for a small amount of time, it's really not uh, a huge amount of energy loss um, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, so it's okay for these to be covered for a short period um, and for uh, the snow to eventually melt off over time. There's also some active things that we can do too. Now these things cost money though. And so we have to evaluate if uh, putting some of these, these mitigation opportunities into, into effect are actually worth the amount of uh, power that is produced uh, if we do that. So those include elevating the panels. So essentially what you're doing is you're making the panels higher so that it leaves more room for uh, snow underneath those panels. And that requires uh, uh, bigger piles, more steel, more equipment, and so it, it's, it's expensive. Um, you can also clean off the panels as well. So actively using a brush or forced air to clean off the panels. Um, you can also do snow removal as well, which includes just uh, you know, essentially snow blowing the snow from underneath the panels into that row, the space in between panels, so that snow can continue to slide off. Uh, again, these things cost money, right? And so as we're continuing to design the project, we're looking at um, comparing the, the, the cost, um, you know, uh, uh, the cost essentially to, to put these uh, mitigation efforts into place and is it worth the amount of energy that we ultimately end up making in the wintertime? So um, uh, we'll continue to evaluate that and figure out what, what's the, the optimal way to, uh, to mitigate the snow. So this is a, a solar resource map. So this is uh, the kind of mapping that I did at the, uh, my first company that I was with, AWS True Power. And so what this shows is that up here in the Upper Peninsula, we're kind of seeing this green color. And if you can compare that to other latitudes um, in, the, uh, in the world, it's comparable to, to Northern Spain, which has quite a bit more uh, solar energy than the US. Um, and also, if you look at Germany, which is at, at a higher latitude, less solar resource, um, uh, you know, considerably better than Germany, again, which has, I think, four times as much installed solar um, as the U.S. So uh, the solar resource up here is absolutely viable. Um, and you can see that when compared to other countries who have invested heavily in solar. These are some examples of that active snow mitigation uh, that I was talking about. Um, and this is also an example of how the snow slides off the, uh, the panels over time. Um, you can see that it slid off these panels and kind of you know, made these piles that are down here. This is a forced air system um, that can be used. Um, and uh, again, you know, expensive, um, but, but definitely an opportunity. Uh, this is a brushing system um, that actually brushes the, uh, the panels off. So is this down here. 
Uh, and this is a, an example of snow blowing that, that snow away from the front edge of the panel. So to make room for more snow coming down. Um, so uh, just to you know, show some examples, you know, we definitely see a lot of solar up in these northern uh, latitudes and even uh, higher up um, than the upper peninsula. Um, and these are some of the strategies um, in place uh, that are available to be able to, to mitigate that snow impact. Uh, so overall benefits of the Superior Solar Project. So we're looking, this project can provide clean, sustainable energy, promoting the natural beauty of the UP, which I think is important to everybody uh, up in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, we're also, we have a, a viable solar uh, resource that can create economically competitive power uh, up here. The project can also help stabilize energy pricing and diversify energy sources in the UP. Right now, the UP is primarily uh, reliant on natural gas. Um, and that gas price can go up and down with the market. If you get an especially cold winter, that natural gas price will go up and energy pricing will also go up as well. Um, and uh, as far as diversification, if you're completely uh, dependent on uh, natural gas for the most part, um, if something happens to that supply or if the price goes up, you're really impacted by that change. Uh, a solar project in the UP will help bring energy uh, generation directly to the upper peninsula to help diversify um, the risk associated with uh, changes in, in natural gas and also help uh, stabilize energy pricing. Uh, the, the pricing coming off a, a solar project is generally fixed for a 20 year period. Now it may escalate over, over time at a fixed rate, um, but it is fixed uh, for a long period and so um, you know, the utilities in the area can rely on that stability of power pricing to help stable, stabilize their energy prices uh, for their retailers and consumers. We're talking about the project bringing 15 to 20 million uh, in new property tax, which is great for every taxpayer up in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, this means more money for everyone and, and less money that the uh, county and, and township need to take from uh, tax payers. Talking about new jobs uh, and the local and the local economic benefit of those workers looking for housing, food, fuel, shopping, and other services. It represents an opportunity for contractors for construction, security, landscaping, and equipment rental. Um, and it's also a, a, a huge opportunity for uh, local education, training, and certification partnership opportunities. Um, and this is one of the, the big uh, synergies with Northern Michigan University that you know this project can provide. Um, education opportunities, everything, you know, ranging from uh, environmental types of, of uh, training to an education to construction management to renewable energy um, and on and on. Um, and it's only, you know, a 15 minute drive from, from Northern Michigan University. So really a great opportunity for, for Northern. Um, in addition to be being able to uh, offer Northern an opportunity to uh, take on great power. And also scholarships to local students as well. We're currently working with a local organization to uh, uh, put in place a scholarship for uh, the Glynn school system. That's something that I like to do in all my projects to, to help you know, um, create more benefits that the project is, is generating. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, John O'Brien. John O'Brien is a student at uh, Northern Michigan University. Uh, that's been uh, really actively involved in uh, the project. Uh, John put together some uh, information on how the project um, can have an impact on, on uh, uh, climate benefits. Um, this information was created and, and presented by John. I want to just note that it's not uh, coming from the Superior Project, um, but I, we thought he did some really great work and it would be a good opportunity for, for him to uh, present it. So please take it away, John. All right, thanks, Courtney. I hope my, <clears throat> I hope my sound is okay. And uh, so, basically, the I came up with with um, some some estimates of of the numbers here. And being that this is a 150 megawatt uh, solar project, um, if you figure the the total number of hours in a year times 150 megawatts multiplied by a capacity factor of 26 percent, so that's kind of an average capacity factor of a solar project at this uh, latitude, um, then you then you come up with this uh, 341 plus 
megawatt hours per year. So if, if that amount of energy was coming from a natural gas power plant, then it would produce 167 plus metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent greenhouse gases. So that does include um, some of the methane that inevitably leaks, um, you know, when you're generating from, from natural gas. Uh, and if you, if you want to get a visualization of, of what that means, that many metric tons of CO2 per year, um, think about it's, it's 30,000 plus cars off the road, basically, per year that this solar farm operates. That's how many, how many emissions are being saved. Um, you could also equate that to almost 71,000 cattle uh, you know, the, the methane emissions, et cetera, that, that cows produce, um, the, the emission savings would be equivalent to that. Uh, or if you want to think about, um, wildfires, almost 3,800 acres of wildfires per year, this would be the reduction of that many wildfires essentially. Um, and then if you, if you want to think about, uh, how this, can impact the carbon footprint of Northern. Um, you know, if Northern were to uh, buy in on, on this project, getting all their electricity from it, um, that would take maybe 20 megawatts of the 150. And they could, they could replace 32% of their carbon footprint. So I, I did this uh, study uh, last semester as an intern for the Sustainability Advisory Council at Northern. And um, I analyzed based on public info and then some stuff that I had to file a Freedom of Information Act request um, to obtain data on their energy use. And uh, it turns out that 32% of, of their carbon footprint comes from their electricity. So you could replace that um, with, with solar and then if you wanted to take it a step further, uh, they have that biomass burning um, boiler at, uh, at the Ripley heating plant that could get another 26%. So these are, you know, readily workable opportunities that um, NMU could implement if it wanted to take steps uh, toward this proposed uh, carbon neutral goal by, by 2050, for example. But um, I also wanted to say that this remaining 37% in the red there on the right, um, that's, that's uh, the steam generation from the Ripley heating plant. Um, but you could replace some of that even with more solar power because a lot of that remaining, that 37% after you, after you um, take the big chunk off from wood, a lot of that 37% is, is cooling in the summer and they have uh, electric cooling units that could run on, on solar power. Also the 1% from liquid fuels, that's transportation. If you were to electrify um, that or, or this domestic gas, that'd be like your stoves and your kitchens. Um, you know, so a big, a big portion of the carbon footprint could be reduced here. So uh, NMU has some um, big opportunities to uh, improve, and, and this could be a, a good step in that direction. Great. Well, thank you very much, John, and, and uh, you know, thank you for, for everyone who joined. I hope this was uh, useful information. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and we've gotten uh, just a wonderful uh, welcome from uh, the, uh, the, the local residents.